Well, um, it's, it changes for me all the time. I mean, I'm not, I don't have a point of view. And my primary job is not public speaking or writing, but exploring. <laughs> when I first started taking mushrooms in, and throughout the 70s when we wrote the Mushroom Grower's Guide, my, I held several opinions, but my most strongly held opinion was it actually is an extraterrestrial. Just no shit flat out. It is an extraterrestrial. And what's surprising to me is that uh, a single mushroom trip uh, of a certain sort could probably put me right back there again. Uh, getting it worked down to Gaia or the overmind of the species is a kind of process of coming down from the real un, uh, uh, assimilatable context of the, of, uh, the experience. It's like an extraterrestrial. It's, I mean, I would certainly say this. You know, if extraterrestrials appeared over Washington and Moscow tomorrow, it wouldn't make this any less mysterious or puzzling. Uh, in fact, uh, the extraterrestrials might turn out to be mundane. This is not. Uh, how it speaks, this is the most astonishing thing for me to get used to. I mean, the visual hallucination, somehow I can work it around that these are floods of imagery set off from deep structures of the brain and dumping of memory banks, and but that it can just address you in real time and say, Terrence, <laughs> you know, and then proceed to blow my mind. The only, and now several things may be happening here, uh, the only time when we have the experience of focusing on an incoming message, decoding it in real time, and responding to it immediately, is when we have a conversation with someone. So if you find yourself responding to a message in real time, uh, your brain automatically thinks you're having a conversation, saying, you know, if it looks like a duck, if it walks like a duck, it must be a duck. So here I am listening and responding to someone speaking to me in English, therefore this must be a conversation. Uh, there are physical arguments for viewing the mushroom as extraterrestrial. First of all, what is psilocybin? Psilocybin is 4-phosphoroxy-NN-dimethyltryptamine. Of all the indole compounds in nature, of all the indole compounds in nature, only psilocybin is uh, uh, hydroxylated at the four position. Well, now, if you were to design a computer program to search Earth, to search the life forms of Earth for evidence of extraterrestrial origin, one of the things you would tell this program to do is look for unusual molecules that have no apparent cousins or relatives among other organisms. Well, here is psilocybin, phosphorylated in the four position. Nothing else on Earth is. A, a, a material argument for its origin outside of the terrestrial ecosystem. Um, a slightly different argument that would see the mushroom as extraterrestrial is uh, look at its uh, style, for want of a better word. I mean, what is a mushroom? First of all, they reproduce by spores. Spores are the most economical biological unit imaginable. They can survive the uh, radiation levels of interstellar space. 
they can survive for eons under conditions very close to those encountered in deep space. Uh, the mushroom spore falls into an ecosystem, <clears throat> immediately undergoes uh, uh, cell division, a fine thread-like network full of neurotransmitters begins to spread itself through the soil. It's a very closely analogous to the neural network of a higher animal, including a human being. Now, we're accustomed to thinking that an extraterrestrial would bear the imprint of the evolutionary situation in which it came to be. In other words, if it was if it evolved on a low gravity planet, it will be tall and thin. If it evolved in a methane atmosphere, it will have an exotic body chemistry and so forth. But that's because we ourselves have possessed the knowledge of how DNA works for only about 40 years. It's reasonable to assume, I think, that if an intelligent species gets a thousand years of study of DNA, that they can design themselves to be however they care to be. And in fact, if you think of the mushroom from that point of view, I think that we might choose that kind of an adaptation if we could have any form we wanted because it's very non-invasive very humbly insinuates itself into a situation and grows essentially on waste material in the soil. Yet when it sporulates, it can actually cross uh, spatial, the boundary of outer space. And, uh, you know, great economy, great artistry, tremendous zen-like aesthetics seem expressed in the mushroom if you view it as a designed piece of work rather than an object in the environment. And then finally, of course, the, the major argument for the extraterrestrial origin of the mushroom, but it's an insider argument, is the content of the experience. Number one, it says it's an extraterrestrial organism, and it has the data to back up the claim. It can show you movies of desert worlds, jungle worlds, high-pressure, high-gravity methane worlds, worlds, uh, planets whose cores are helium-4, and uh, worlds un where you don't know whether you're inside an organism or inside some kind of piece of machinery, whether you're under the surface of a planet. I mean, th literally things that our minds just stop in the presence of. So to me, that's really the interesting thing about the mushroom is that it can be as friendly as it needs to be and can even reassure you with a Disney-esque uh, burlesque of dancing flowers and uh, pirouetting pink elephants. But once you are comfortable with it and enter the dialogue and begin to get to know it, Getting to know it is an appalling experience because you can say to it, show me a little more of who you are for yourself. And then, you know, a veil is lifted and your jaw just drops. And then you say, show me a little more of who you are. That's enough of who you are for yourself. Because, and you wonder, you know, while this thing is talking to me, is it talking, is how engaged is the mushroom by me? Is, it, is all of its attention focused upon me when I'm talking to it, the way all of my attention is focused back on it? Or is it like a multi-user computer system? Is it able to simultaneously deal with huge numbers of organisms? What is the relationship of psilocybin to the inner life of the mushroom? Is it stoned all the time? Why does it want, why is it so important that these indole compounds get lodged in the nervous system of mammals? It's almost as though it's a symbiotic 
relationship, that the mushroom does not truly live its life unless it is taken, unless its molecular, uh, its unique molecular component can find its way into the synapses of a self-reflecting higher animal. Well, then what is it, what are we for for it? And, you know, you can ask these questions. Well, I think that it's observant. Like, they don't, you know, they don't impose themselves on them. You have to approach Yes, they usually, one reason I think people have had trouble confirming the animate and intelligent quality of the mushroom is you must ask. You know, you just don't take psilocybin and sit there because it won't do it. But if you take psilocybin and call it in, in some sense, whatever that means, invoke, call, uh, uh, try to uh, visualize, then it will begin to come towards you and lift these veils and this world of zany, pun-like, hyperdimensional intelligence that is revealed is as strange as an extraterrestrial would be. This is, I guess, the final content of evidence <coughs> for the extraterrestrial origin is the fact that it just seems so different from anything one could conceive of or imagine. I mean, you cannot, in one of these volleys of hallucination, convince yourself, this is only me. These are my memories, or these are distorted transforms of past experience. Or, because, uh, you know, I was, uh, I was trained as an art historian to have an eye for stylistic difference and cohesion of, uh, of uh, a set of aesthetic canons, and it just blows my mind. I mean, there is more art locked up in these things to be viewed in a single hour than the human race has produced in 10,000 years. I mean, and art of a compelling, weird, breathtaking, awesome quality that just breathes in every pore of itself. You know, this is the other. This is not you. Don't be deceived, my little primate friend. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It just seems like our popular culture is that anything to that. Because if you look at the movies that came out, you know, between 1952 and 1962, so many of those sci-fi movies are about spores from outer space and plants coming down. And these are from very straight people who hadn't taken, you know, psychedelics at all. They were like tuning, maybe they were, you know, tuning into what was about to come 10 or 15 years later. Well, I think, uh, and I'm, so far as I know, pretty alone in this opinion, that uh, information actually, a very small percentage of information is able to tunnel backward through time, that there is a very small counterflow to the forward movement of causal efficacy. And one of the things that shamanism is about is going into that hyperdimensional place and picking up this thin, thin signal from the future and tuning it in. This is why prophecy and seership and all of that has to do with states of ecstasy and intoxication. Uh, one way of viewing uh, all religion and all uh, spiritual metaphor making is as an anticipation of the future. These Western religions have this apocalyptic transformation built into them almost as a self-fulfilling prophecy. In other words, they believe the world is going to end because the world is going to end. And since the melting of the glaciers, people of sufficient sensitivity have heard through a vast wall of stochastic noise coming from the future the thin, reedy broadcast station of uh, the true vision of the future. And this seems to be one of the things that you can do with these psychedelics is tune this in. It, you know, it's a cliche, and I'm sure you've heard it, that artists are society's antenna for change. 
that artists are supposed to be somehow uh, m more sensitive than the rest of us and, and they pick up the new design forms, the evolving aesthetic canons and then translate it into society for the rest of us. Well, that gains a little more bite if you substitute shaman for artist and realize that this may not be a metaphor. It may not be simply because they pursue bohemian lifestyles and are willing to accept poverty for a life of free thinking and so forth. That isn't what's allowing an anticipation of the future. What's happening is there truly is an anticipation of the future. And uh, uh, visionaries like William Blake or, or the author of Revelations are actually people who, by virtue of some fortuitous confluence of circumstance, space, time, and uh, genetic constitution, are able to draw these messages out. What is startling is that apparently this is fairly ordinary in psychedelic states. That in fact, uh, one way of thinking of psychedelics is uh, you begin to move through time when you put them into your life. I don't mean while the trip is happening. I mean ever after. I mean, if you're living with a 1960s style mind and you have a strong psychedelic experience, you will come down with a 1970s mind or perhaps a 2040 style mind. Mind is a temporal style. It, it's important to have this information and to have it at your fingertips. People... The compartmentalization between areas of knowledge that impinge on this always amazes me. I mean, you get psychologists who don't know what an MAO inhibitor is. Uh, you get uh, people combining things without knowing how drug synergies work. Uh, you get people, you know, just not informing themselves on the importance of set, setting, dosage, psychic predisposition, so forth and so on, all vital matters that can uh, impinge on uh, how an experience develops. And if, if you will take the time to inform yourself, you will feel much more sure of what you're doing, and that in itself can alleviate uh, uh, confusion and uh, negative reactions. Well, so then I thought what I would do is uh, <clears throat> sort of go around the world and talk about these things a little to give you an idea of what is available, what's on the menu, and, uh, and then we'll take a little break, a very short break, and then come back and talk about it. Sure, absolutely. Did I hear you correctly that uh, chemical, the liquid DMS fell, drinking so five to seven ounces a day for five days precipitates a psychedelic experience? No, did I say DMSO? I thought it was one graphic. Is it DMSO? No, it, right? it isn't DMSO. If I said that, I didn't mean to. It's di -epho di Dimethylacetamide. Oh, I thought you said sulfoxide. I may have said sulfoxide. Dimethylacetamide. And uh, I can show you the river here. You just, while I'm raving, you just look it up in there to find it and satisfy yourself. Jerry? Yeah. Before you start, could you explain the difference between psychoactive, psychotropic, and psychedelic? Because I don't understand what they mean. Yeah, if I can. Uh, psychoactive means exactly what it implies, that you can detect this compound as a higher cortical experience. That's all. I mean, to my mind, a higher cortical experience is a shift of mood, uh, depression, elation, uh, uh, acute hearing, sensitivity to noises, 
all of these things could be classed as psychoactive uh, reactions to a compound. Psychotropic is a word that I've never been very fond of, and it sort of came in late. Uh, uh, psychedelic, which is a fairly maligned word, but was coined by the psychiatrist Humphrey Osmond, uh, means simply mind manifesting. And I like that because it's phenomenologically neutral. Now, some people have tried to push the word entheogen for these things, meaning literally God-inducing. But to my mind, this carries a huge amount of ideological freight that we may not wish to buy into. I mean, maybe it's God-inducing, maybe it isn't. But uh, uh, psychedelic, meaning mind-manifesting, is pretty good. And then if all of these make you uncomfortable, you can just fall back on a completely phenomenological description and call them consciousness-expanding drugs. But there are drugs that I would not... I, for instance, I don't consider... Well, I certainly don't consider alcohol a psychedelic, but clearly a psychoactive. Uh, well... Uh, Marijuana is one of these things that's so widely variant, both in how people react to it and how strong it can be. I would call MDMA a psychoactive drug, not a psychedelic drug. And then I use the word hallucinogen a lot. And a lot of people don't like that, even people in the field, and say, well, hallucinogen seems to imply that it's an illusion, but not to, in my mind, I don't hear that. I'm fascinated by hallucinations. I mean, to me, that is the sine qua non that you're getting somewhere. I guess because it's just my philosophical biases. But, when, but a hallucination, it's such an extraordinary concept, isn't it? To see something which isn't there. And I don't mean to misread a surface so that you think it sticks into the room, which in fact sticks out of the room or something. I mean seeing something that is not there. And then that divides into two classes, seeing an ordinary object which is not there. And I think this is what most people think a hallucination is. Here is a bicycle. Is it real or not? The drug-crazed victim cannot tell. But most hallucinations are of things which can only be hallucinations because they, that's what they are, you know. And so they have this aura of the unexpected and the other and, uh, and the intrusive alienness. Uh, people have claimed to me that they have seen objects which are not there, which are completely ordinary. That is more typical of accounts of Datura users, people who take uh, high molecular weight tropanes, such as occur in Jimson weed and those kind of things. But my brief experimentation with that is it is uh, what I call a, a, a deliriant rather than a psychoactive. I mean, when you take Datura, you are so messed up that you can't, you literally lose all discrimination. Yeah, Belladonna. You can't tell exactly where you are. You can't tell thinking about being somewhere from being there. Well, this you're in no shape to undertake a spiritual quest if you're that discombobulated. So uh, what I like are the things which do not destroy what I call core functions. In other words, there is still an evidence-gathering, observing mind left intact, and the um, disruption of perceptual input, if you want to put it that way, is pretty much confined to the visual cortex and then to the, to the uh, metaphor-forming capacity that is relating to the visual cortex. But I don't like things which confuse you, which impair judgment. Uh, what about sativa divinorum? Salvia divinorum. 
Well, that's a kind of a, that's an obscure one about which not much is known. Although in the past year they've learned the absolute chemical characterization of the psychoactive compound, which is called salvorine alpha. Um, more work has to be done. Anthropologists who have taken it with Indians uh, in Oaxaca describe a very intense experience. When we grew it in Hawaii and took it exactly the way these people said to do it, it was an experience, but it was not clear whether it was psychedelic or merely so physiologically active in such a complex way that you couldn't tell exactly what was going on. The impression, which was not mine, but uh, uh, Katz and a beloved Dean, uh, they both experienced uh, flow. They described the experiences as though you were lying in a dirty ditch <laughs> with this cold fluid flowing from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet and where this kind of cold, clammy fluid encountered energy obstructions in your body, it would wash them away. But it was a kind of vertigo with nausea, with... I mean, it was a complex uh, experience, but it was not largely mental. Mm -hmm. It was more a revisioning of the body image. And, you know, this is another one of these things where no research uh, has been done. It isn't illegal, uh, Salvia Divinorum, but you're not going to do your career any good to get tangled up with this. So consequently, it's pretty much left alone. Salvorine alpha is extremely unstable and breaks down within 12 hours. So that indicates it's probably a polyhydric alcohol or an isoquinone or something like that. It's not an indole. Yeah. I'm just curious, um, and Watson talks about antigens versus hallucinogens, and uh, he's really against the word hallucinogen. Yeah, he's the one who proposed entheogen. Entheogen, right. And so... Because he, his theory was, I guess, that he thought that a hallucination was something that wasn't there completely. And he thought that the experience on the soma or the mushroom was something that you actually are experiencing. So it's not a hallucination, it's real. Yeah, that was what he said. Um, but if you actually look at the etymology of the word hallucination, what it's come to mean in English is a delusion. A delusion. But what it really means in the original uh, language is to wander in the mind. That's the meaning of hallucination, to wander in the mind. Well, that's a pretty good operational description of what's happening. And then when you add in the visual component, uh, uh, I don't know. It's hard for me to imagine how someone could undervalue hallucinations if they had had them. 60s hoopla a lot, the, the, uh, the hoopla or LSD and the misreading of what these experiences really were, too. Well, these guys were very uh, frustrated with seeing this thing turned into a social hysteria. And Wasson, you know, at times expressed great unhappiness with Tim Leary's approach and hated going to Mexico and seeing these mushroom villages invaded by graffiti-covered vans of filthy freaks from Southern California who were disrupting the local ecology. And uh, it was a kind of proprietary approach, you know. This thing belongs to anthropologists, to specialists. Uh, Watson was very reticent to, to assess his own work. Some of you may have seen Bob Forte's interview with him in the, that psychedelic issue of revision where Forte asks him, how do you assess the historical impact of your work? And he said, you know, I, I'll leave that to others to decide. He didn't want to deal with the question of the potential impact on his own society. He really looked at it as this exotic, foreign kind of thing. These guys were cautious this first generation, Hoffman, Wasson, Schultz.
Schultes. These are these guys are not stoners by any means. I mean, their approach is cautious, and the psychedelic experiences can be counted on the fingers of one hand in a lifetime. So I'm not sure they ever realized the size of the tiger whose tail they had seized. Yeah. Uh, the the uh, DMT and the frog, uh, whatever it is, how is that extracted? I mean, how that frog slime or whatever it is? Toad. Uh, Toad. Bam- yeah, bam- right. Okay, now I want to know about that. Well, I haven't had the good fortune to be present at the milking, uh, so I really couldn't say. But as I gather, you put pressure on the back of the neck in two places, and this exudate emerges exactly where, I'm not sure, and probably decency should safely, scarcely inquire. (laughs) And then it's dried dried on sheets of glass and scraped up and packaged and so forth. Well, let me start through this and uh, give you a notion of what is available. Whenever you talk about the, the distribution and cultural usage of hallucinogens, the first thing that you come up against is a curious, unsolved problem in botany, which is no one knows why this is, and we would be grateful if somebody could figure it out. But for unknown reasons, there is a tremendous concentration of psychoactive plants in the, on the South American continent. The South American continent has more known hallucinogens than the rest of the planet combined. Now, why is this? After all, the climax tropical rainforests of eastern Indonesia are at least as species-rich as the Amazon basin, and yet not a single powerful hallucinogen is known with certainty from the old world tropics. Uh, All kinds of suggestions have been made that actually there are psychedelic plants common throughout the the tropics of the old world, but the cultures have lost contact with them and forgotten them, and hence our anthropologists have not discovered them. Or something in the soil of South America. Very improbable theory. Uh, I was talking about this once in a workshop, and somebody raised their hand and said, well, no problem. Obviously, that's where the spaceships landed. (laughs) Good. Well, we've solved that problem. Now we can move on. Uh, North America is extraordinarily poor in hallucinogens, perhaps the poorest of all continents, so that the, the psychedelic phobia that Europe created against paganism was completely reinforced, or at least not eroded, by the colonization of the New World or of North America because there were no plants here to challenge that. The North American Indians tend to ordeal as a shamanic vehicle, the Sundance thing, some of you may be familiar with, or sonic driving, which is worldwide in in shamanically oriented cultures without drugs. You should know that not everyone agrees with me that Uh, um, psychedelics are the sine qua non of shamanism that's what Wasson thought that you don't have shamanism unless you have psychedelics if you have people calling themselves shamans and not using psychedelics then they are uh, cut off from the older level of tradition and through ritual drumming or deals starvation, flagellation, they are creating near-psychedelic or pseudo-psychedelic states. Uh, Now, a brilliant and respected commentator on comparative religion like Merci Eliade, who I quote whenever it suits my purpose, uh, totally disagreed with this and said no, what he called narcotic shamanism, which means psychedelic shamanism, the choice of the word tells you that the guy had a problem. Narcotic shamanism is decadent shamanism, 
and the flagellation, the starvation, the ordeals, and the drumming, that's the real shamanism. And it's only when the tradition is abandoned and decadent that, that a culture will turn to drugs. I maintain this is nothing more than he was a Romanian who became an academic in Paris. I maintain that this is nothing more than his Western cultural bias operating. Also in his youth, he was pretty infatuated with yoga. They will insist to you, you know, that drugs are an inferior path. However, any of you who are scholars of yoga should know that all yoga is based on the yogic sutras of Patanjali, 2nd century B.C., uh, Hindu Vedic commentator. And Patanjali specifically says there are three paths to the goal of yoga, and they are control of the breath, control of posture, and light-filled herbs. says it right there. Stanza six of the Yogic Sutra of Patanjali. It's never discussed again, basically, in the entire exegesis of the yogic literature. The third path is never mentioned. Well, is that because it's a secret tradition or what? I don't know. When you go to India seeking these yogins, practicing these higher yogas, what you find are a bunch of guys smoking as much charas as they possibly can. And the notion that you could do it without that it just gets a long laugh from everybody down around the burning guts. I mean, they, they deal with it on a practical level. Okay, moving out of drug-impoverished North America or psychedelic-impoverished North America, where there are... Uh, uh, more than 20 species of indigenous psilocybin-containing mushrooms, but, and this is interesting, no evidence whatsoever for uh, tribal or traditional usage. In other words, in this northwest coast Indian complex, the Shimsham, Klingit, Nutka group, no uh, reason to believe, other than our own predilection for romantic fantasy, that these people were using mushrooms uh, in pre-contact times, and yet the mushrooms were there. Uh, the complex that we're most familiar with as a North American hallucinogen is in the southwest of the United States, peyote, Lophophora williamsi, uh, the, the peyotal cactus. Now, the interesting thing here is uh, we cannot find archaeological evidence of peyote use that is particularly ancient. Uh, peyote use does, in the southwest appears to be less than 500 years old. Before that, what we find in Indian graves of the Tarahumara and so forth are the seeds of Sephora secundifolia. Sephora secundifolia is a highly poisonous legume that contains cysteine. This is an example of what we call not a psychedelic, but an ordeal poison. Now, in certain parts of the world, this approach to spiritual growth has been taken, most notably in, on the island of Madagascar, off the coast of uh, eastern Africa. What is an ordeal poison? This is a plant where you take it and you are so convinced that you're dying that you have an experience of self-abandonment, uh, getting straight, surrender, and then you live. And you're fine. You know, but, but you are absolutely convinced that you're dying. Your heart pounds or fibrillates or you convulse, or you fall into deep coma, or you become have tetanus in the limbs, whatever it is, and then you recover. Well, anybody can tell you this is a kind of psychedelic experience because you're so damn glad you lived that you see everything in a new light. You can be kind to your children and love your wife and tolerate your relatives. And People say, well, it made a new man out of him. Well, yes, because he came so close to dying that uh, he shed uh, neurotic behavior patterns.
but this is not a true psychedelic. So what we're assuming is that about 500 or 1,000 years ago, sometime in that span, the Sephora cult was replaced by the uh, peyote cult, which came from a much smaller usage area. Then also in Southern California, there were what were called the Tolach religions, religions of detura intoxication, initiation of young men by intoxicating them with detour and leaving them in the wilderness to fend for themselves. Again, this is comes close to being an ordeal poison, although it also has psychoactive properties, but so confusing, such a delirium, that uh, it bears no relationship to the true hallucinogens, which, with the exception of mescaline, I believe all fall into the category of the indoles. Now, mescaline is not an indole. It's an amphetamine, closely related to MDA and MDMA. Uh, but it is a true hallucinogen at fairly high doses. The indoles, which are this structurally related small family, they seem to me to be the true visionary ecstatogens. Uh, and I will mention as I go through the list which ones are indoles and which ones are not. Uh, well, no, the only one which is an amphetamine is mescaline, so we needn't... So we have indole and non-indole. Indole and non-indole. Uh, uh, a kind of parallel phenomenon to the peyote cult of the southwest is in the deserts of northwestern Peru. There are very large columnar cacti in the genus Trichoceras that contain mescaline. And they have been used for a long time, a lot longer than peyote. We have... Uh, mocha ceramic uh, dated to before 1000 BC, which show, in fact, doesn't somebody wearing, yes, this gentleman has the t-shirt. This is a Peruvian design. Point out the, yes, that's the chunk of San Pedro being held by this dwarf-like little demon. This is a fang demon, mocha design, 1500 years old. <coughs> now, in central Mexico, we come upon uh, the first of these large centers of hallucinogenic use in the cultural area in which the Olmec arose, were subsequently succeeded by the Maya, who were subsequently subjugated by the Toltecs. And the uh, plants that were in use in those situations were fall into two pretty well-defined categories. First of all, psilocybin-containing mushrooms of several species, and second of all, con uh, morning glories of at least two types, convolvulaceae, which contain LSD-like alkaloids active in the milligram range that are highly visionary. And uh, there's considerable evidence in the Codex Vindabonensis and uh, in some of the Mayan ceramics that uh, this was a, a, a culture that made a very important place for hallucinogens and that it was the privilege of the priestly class and that their uh, obsession with calendrics and astronomy and uh, this sort of thing was also somehow intimately connected to their interest in the psilocybin mushrooms. And again, one of these botanical puzzles, here is a cluster of uh, 10 or 15 species in central Mexico of mushrooms, and a culture builds itself around them. Uh, a similar cluster of species on the north northwest coast the culture seems to totally ignore it and have no use for it. And nowhere else on Earth are there clusters of species of psilocybin mushrooms uh, with a long history of use. Naturally, the export of cattle throughout the warm tropics has allowed the coprophytic mushrooms, the mushrooms which grow on manure, to be spread throughout the warm tropics. And then in places like England and France, you get the occurrence of the diminutive psilocybin mushrooms, lanceata. But again, only the most unconvincing evidence of traditional use. I mean, I am Irish, Celtic. I would love to have somebody come up with a, a bunch of evidence that ancient Celtic and Druidic art and magic 
was somehow related to mushrooms. But to date, the efforts have been unconvincing to any skeptic. Uh, it may still be there. Perhaps in heraldic devices, someone should go back and study the escutcheon of the families of medieval Europe. And you do find, uh, for instance, the Morel family, Morelli, noble Italian family, mushrooms on the, on the family coat of arms, and uh, other families in France whose names escape me. Yeah, although that is a coincidence, not Well, a I mean, not right. yeah, but still, that name. Will the sergeant at arms. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, oh, well, let me say something a little bit more <clears throat> about the morning glory complex, because it's very interesting. Uh, LSD discovered by Albert Hoffman in 1937 and so forth, uh, comes from ergot, comes from uh, an organism called claviceps, or claviceps paspali, which is a smut which grows on ergot, a humbler organism. You could hardly imagine. I mean, this is basically yuck, is how you would describe this organism if you were to come upon it. It looks like a mistake because it's just an amorphous, slimy black mess growing on certain cereal grains. And one of the fascinating questions to these chemists, once they discover a new compound, is to try and figure out, does it occur anywhere else in nature? Some plant, some fish, some something, and then they, you, know, you can form uh, theories and judgments about evolutionary relationships. Uh, so Albert Hoffman, the discoverer of LSD, was amazed when carrying out analytical work for Gordon Wasson on magic morning glory seeds that had been sent to Wasson from Schultes. He discovered the same compounds or very closely related compounds as he had synthesized to make LSD.